Thursday morning. Welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Briefing. Thank you for all those people who have subscribed and reviewed. It's been a pleasure reading and uh, seeing this thing move up the charts. So thank you for that. Got another great conversation for you this week. Um, it's interesting. This is the first time that we're going to have two people on. So it's husband and wife. I've known them both for a long time. I knew them both separately and then together. Um, it's Matt and Mercy Schlapp. Matt is the chairman of the American Conservative Union. The ACU puts on CPAC. So if you if you haven't been to a CPAC, and I talk about this with Matt and Mercy, man, have they changed in the last 20 years. Um, they went from like being in old stodgy hotels in downtown D.C. to now very dynamic, very vibrant Um the, the media interest, especially from folks on the right, is unbelievable. Um, you walk down Media Row, and it's it's just like a testament to how exponential media on the right has grown. Um, you know, you still get your traditional media there, but whatever. And then the speakers and the, the presentations and everything, it's just, it's become like a mini convention while um, it happens. And, and obviously, the last couple of years, they've split it between, not split it. They've done it twice. So it's in Florida and then they do one in Dallas. Used to be in D.C., but COVID forced them out. But I think what I focus on in this episode is sort of their evolution. And it's funny. I mean, we are we actually don't live far away. Uh, we're like a block away. <laughs> um, our kids have grown up in the same school together. Their kids are different ages, but, but we've all gone to the same school, the same church. And the thing that's interesting is we've all had very unique experiences, but it's similar in the same way in the sense that we came to Capitol Hill to work on um, the Hill and in politics, and then our lives took twists, t- twists and turns. And we ended up, I think, at least in a place that no one would have expected. And that's why I think that's so fun about this podcast. And we talked to these folks over and over again in, in the trajectory of their lives. And Matt and Mercy were both Hill staffers, and they both ended up in the White House and then You know, now they're on television a lot. Mercy co-hosts a lot of the shows on Newsmax. She's been on Spicer and Company a ton. When Lindsay's been away, she's co-hosted. She does Prime News at 9 a lot with Jen Pellegrino. Uh, Matt's obviously very active um, on on TV, does the show a lot as well. Um, But it's just fascinating. And as a couple, it was interesting for me to talk about their trajectory, not just as individuals, but as as couples and how they raise a family in this environment they have five girls we talk about that how what it's like to to deal with that so i hope you enjoy this conversation because i think it's so fascinating where they came from where they are now and by the way at the end we talk about where they might be going whether or not we're going to see either one of them on a ballot so without further ado matt and mercy schlapp Excited today to be joined by Matt and Mercy Schlapp. This is a twofer. Like just <laughs> one, but we'd asked Mercy to be on and Matt jumped in. I'm getting out of this show. Um, That's usually the way it is. He likes to take over my hits, John. You know true. how that it's is. It's just the opposite. I'm like, why don't you do this? <laughs> See, we're already off to a good start. Um, I, I think it's a, a, I'm looking forward to this discussion because I think like so many people that we've had on the podcast, we we see where you are now and it's always a question of, okay, how did you get there? And I want to start uh, if I can, ironically with you, Matt, Um, you know, I, your mom was a city councilwoman in, in, uh, in Kansas, as I understand, is that what, what made you want to get into politics? Is that. No, the opposite. I was always political. I was just one of these people that, you know, when I was young, C-SPAN came about, you could really watch what was going on in the started with the floor of the House of Representatives. I remember watching a young Newt Gingrich and a young Trent Lott and Bob Walker and all these people. And I always had subscriptions to like U.S. News and World Report when that was real and later National Review and the American Spectator. So like I just always liked politics, always watched the news, always read a lot. Uh, Did you you get involved in the campaigns though? Or was it just- I um, did. I did. I was- um, I grew up in Houston, so we always liked the Bush family. Um, George H.W. Bush had been our congressman in Houston for a short period of time. My my parents worked on that campaign, but they weren't really political. So it was me being political, I think, that helped uh, spur the rest of my family to be political. And eventually my mom, who was a Democrat, became a Republican. She was kind of like a pro-life Democrat. She became a Republican and eventually ran for office. It just shows you our family's experience is very typical, which is Americans... By and large, they don't really 
view politics as something to really spend a lot of time in. They view it as maybe corrupt and dirty. I don't blame them for thinking that, <laughs> but uh, it, you kind of have to push Americans into politics. They don't, most of them don't want to do it by nature. Right. Well, Mercy, I mean, you, you grew up um, the, the daughter of, of a Cuban immigrant who escaped captivity as a political prisoner. I mean, so was that your motivation? Do, were they sort of after, after recognizing um, what they went through, were they encouraging someone like you to get involved in politics or were they, were they themselves political based on their background? What was, give me, give me right. your. Well, your... It, Sean, it was actually when you became press secretary at the white house that very much inspired me to go into oh. politics. No, I'm Good. kidding. But I will say I wasn't as nerdy as Matt Schaap where Matt Schaap at 15 years old. Now he did not have white hair at the time, but uh, he had like black curly hair watching C-SPAN and reading National Review, obviously much more of an intellect than I would have ever been. But I remember, uh, you know, as a young child, uh, my father and my mom and my, really my aunts and uncles, we'd sit around the table, the kitchen table, and my father would basically talk to us about the dangers of communism, the dangers of socialism, how you could quickly lose a country uh, like he, he, he and his family did in Cuba. You know, my father obviously was, uh, you know, building his businesses, really looking forward to living in Cuba. And then all of a sudden Fidel Castro came into power and he fought against the communists. And because of it, he was thrown into jail. And his story uh, really resonated uh, with me. And it, it's truly, I knew since a, a small, you know, as a young child, that I could, I needed to be part of this fight. I needed to be part of this fight to know that uh, in America, we have these incredible freedoms and that we have to do everything we can, you know, to protect them and, and, and protect our constitution. And, uh, and so I remember at the age of 15 years old, I joined, uh, you know, uh, the presidential campaign. It was a Bush quail campaign back in the day. I was very young and I really absolutely loved it. I loved the retail politics. I loved being able to, persuade people to vote for my candidate. And, uh, and then I knew that that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It's interesting. It, 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 I mean, very similar. I've talked about this openly that, you know, my family wasn't political either. I just sort of, I got that bug. Um, but I know Matt, I think you and I first crossed paths when you were on Capitol Hill, you were working for Todd Tehart. Mercy, I think you at one point were at the RNC, but I want to fast forward to 2000. There's a, obviously, you, you mentioned the Bushes. George Bush is running against Al Gore. Everything comes down to Florida. Matt, you get in the thick of things uh, in what affectionately became known as the Brooks Brothers Riot down in South Florida. Uh, can you tell people what, what that was? Yeah, so when Republicans protest, they call it a riot. When Democrats riot, they call it a protest. This was like the most mannerly. We did have some New Yorkers but it was the most mannerly, quote unquote, riot you ever saw. We, I, they called the Brooks Brothers riot because we were so even properly dressed in our, you know, uh, uh, leather belts and loafers and blah, blah, blah. But it was right in the middle of Dade County. They had decided to do something that we now understand, which is take the ballots and put them behind closed locked doors. And the county commission wanted to account the rest of the ballots adjudicate whether they had been for Gore or Bush without any observers, which breaks the real spirit in a democracy that there's transparency whenever you're counting ballots, looking at ballots. And uh, we decided to storm that floor of the Dade County Courthouse. I remember Ed Gillespie was there and Barry Jackson and some others. And they essentially said to me, would you go up with these guys and just make sure kind of it stays on the rails? So uh, it then quickly just turned into this spontaneous moment the cameras were all there and you know they were caught red-handed i mean this idea that stealing and cheating and rigging elections is new is wrong uh lyndon baines johnson won every election successful election he had by stealing it and paying people off and what they were trying to do in dade county is what they do in a lot of big cities is they were going to democrat officials were on the cusp of finding enough ballots for al gore so you know, democracy really does hang by a thread, and it just takes citizens to get enraged to make the difference. So, Mercy, you, you know, you guys, Bush obviously wins. Uh, you both end up in the White House, Matt, in the political office. Um, and, and you've got this Brooks brother wearing 
loafer wearing. <laughs> no, he would wear you. cowboy boots. Cowboy often. boots. He was always cowboy, cowboy boots. boots. Okay. So walk me through how that all happened. So you guys end up there. Had you met before that? What what kind of, how did- We how think did we met. We, we're, we, we always talk about this. We were both on the fourth floor of Canon. I'm working for Todd Tehart. She is interning for Lincoln Diaz. I'm working for Lincoln Diaz Ballard. Ballard right. and working for him. And so we were both, the offices were near each other. So we must have passed each other in the hallway um, a bunch of times. I was too busy trying to find a Cuban husband, Sean, and that didn't quite work out. So, um, so my yeah. other alternative was to find the gringo. So that that's how in the White House, you know, it it all came into being. Actually, the real story is, is that Matt was in the political office. My boss at the time was Nicole Wallace, the infamous Nicole Wallace, who now has her show on MSNBC. And is a full-scale liberal. And she's kind of lost her way. And, you know, I, I we were both, so there was, as you know, in the White House, there's always this tension between the media affairs office and the political office. But the political people always just want to go and, you know, do more than they should. The media people are warning them this could be problematic. These could be the potential stories that could come out. So in, in good faith, the media team and the political team tried to do these weekly meetings to really have a kumbaya, you know, a, almost like a, like a, a, you know, a peace agreement that would come between the two offices. And so when I, I, I think Matt, actually, you probably thought that was a bit of a joke. So then I- Well, it was really have... the political people trying to push the communications people to do what they wanted them to do. No, 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 no. It was the communications people trying to tell the political people to what not off. to do. Exactly. So, so it's this always, is a constant the tension there. So I walk into the room, you know, I'm, I'm young and, uh, you know, one of the few Latina staffers there, I walk in, slap sitting on the couch with his cowboy boots and his, and his gray suit. And I was like, hmm, who's this interesting guy? And what I really found charming is that Matt, and it was in, in, in Richard Nixon's old office. So it was EOB, it's old, the old executive office building, a 180. Which Obama which turned into like converted. a civil rights museum. Yeah. And so we were both sitting there and I just found him to, he's, you know, obviously Matt's very funny. He's got a great sense of humor. And while everyone else was taking it incredibly seriously, Matt would, of course, have these great one-liners. And I was like, who's this interesting guy with white hair and cowboy boots? So I thought he was a Texan. Later, I found out he's a Kansan. And then it took a while for Matt to ask me out on a date. Uh, it was not until we uh, basically had a nice conversation at a Boehner party. And Sean, I'm sure you remember the John Boehner parties. Yes. And they, uh, and at that point, you know, I was like, going, what's wrong with this guy? I'm like super cute. You know, I've got, I know how to dance salsa. Come on. Like what's happening here. And I'm a good conservative Catholic. So finally it was actually Nicole who told Matt, stop being so stupid. So like you need nope, to ask you're her. This is all out. untrue. Oh my God. Wow. No, no. I had already asked you out. No, you had. Oh, yes, well, I had. And we were going on a date the next night. When yeah, but it took to like a lot for you to ask me out. Because why? Because my boss had been trying to ask you out well, there and my colleague had gone on a few dates with you. You always leave that out. So wait, wait, who's your boss, Matt? Ken Melman, ironically. Well, that wouldn't have so, worked out well. <laughs> so Ken would meet with me to say, why can't I get Mercy to go out with me? And so this is happening. Well, I think Mercy is kind of flirting with me. And then my other colleague was actually going on dates with her. And I would say, well, how would you do over the weekend? Well, I had a date with Mercy. So I was like, oh, this is getting very difficult to manage. So I was... Uh, as you would have, Sean, I was trying to also be a good friend while trying to figure this piece out. And yeah, uh, but it all point, had a happy ending. At, at some point, three people in the office trying to it probably wouldn't have gone over to us. Tells so. you tells you what a hot commodity Mercy right. really was. All yeah. these guys were circling around probably Mercy and Dana Prino. That was probably the way it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be accurate. So I, I know you guys have talked about this before, but but you've you've mentioned how 9-11 was the day that you kind of decided that you wanted to get married or, or further your relationship. Tell me why and what, what that meant. I'll start with you, Mercy. Well, Sean, you know, obviously 9 and 11 is one of those days that none of us will forget where we were um, and what was hap obviously what happened that tragic day. And both of us were in the White House. Uh, I was just, you know, we were watching the news, the to towers get hit in New York City, the Twin Towers. Um, uh, and it was, everyone was in high alert, incredibly stressful. We were getting these stories that there was, you know, potential bombs at the State Department, what was happening at the Pentagon, the Pentagon gets hit. 
Uh, so we're you it, back in the day in the White House, they did not have uh, like an emergency system in place to basically, you know, over the loudspeaker say, get out now, evacuate immediately. Instead, you could hear from the outside the Secret Service running down the hallway yelling, get out, exit the building immediately. So it is complete mayhem. It is so chaotic. We're all running out of the building. I think, Matt, you were one of the last ones to leave. That's right. And we end up going into two different directions. So there's the, the staff is told to go to the secret location. I was with uh, Nicole Wallace and several other uh, uh, female colleagues. We end up instead going to actually Ed Gillespie's office building for quite some time that's in downtown DC. As you remember, Sean, everything was at a standstill. There was no way to even get into your car and get out of the city. So we're walking everywhere. So we end up in Georgetown, Matt's in this secret location. And then at that point, I think Matt goes down and says, I can't find mercy. So he calls, gets out of the building, calls his sister. His sister basically says, you need to find her and tell her that you love her was in essence what happened. And I think for both of us, it was a really, it was such a wake up call that life is so short and that we knew, you know, we had only dated for, a, you know, a little over a month, but wow. uh, we just knew that, that we were meant to be together and that was our future. And that, um, and so it was, it went pretty quickly at that point where then we decided to get engaged on December 12th, which is the feast day of our lady of Guadalupe and then get married seven, you know, about seven months after that, uh, on July 13th of the following year. And it, and it, I just think it just really taught us all that, you know, that when you know, you love someone like, don't wait, like really life is too short. You never know what's going to happen. And to have that, you know, the fact that we had built such a strong relationship and now obviously we've been married for 20 years, we have five kids, uh, you know, it's really been a, a huge blessing, I think, in our marriage. Um, and, and, and I really think for us, uh, while, you know, the working in the White House has been so exciting and wonderful and we met there, it's been the journey, this, this incredible journey that we've had together that I think has been an incredible blessing. I mean, the, the interesting part of that too, politically, is it's just that, I, I agree with how Mercy characterized the situation. We knew pretty quickly. Um, and I talked about going down and talking to her father, but 9-11 just was like, put everything on fast forward. I mean, a lot of people joined the military. I say that from my experience, a lot of people grew up on that day. They just say, yeah. look, you know, I'm in my thirties. I'm a political guy. You understand this, Sean. You're like, you're kind of a vagabond when you're a political person. And all of a sudden it kind of hit me like, okay, that could have a very lonely conclusion if I keep doing this. And, um, but I think politically, the other thing that's interesting is that we were so wrapped up in the Bush world. Uh, we had both come from the Bush campaign. Mercy had come from the RNC. Um, and, you know, so 20 years later, I'm, I'm still kind of shocked how many of the people we were close friends with have kind of dropped us or dissed us or, you know, become basically Democrats. Uh, and so huh. it's been strange. That would be the one thing if you would have said to me, um, a week after we got married, hey, looking 20 years into the future, what would be a dynamic? I never would have guessed that there's been this kind of uh, Bush Cheney split from from you know grassroots Republicans. It's interesting. Yeah, that is a it is an interesting dynamic, and and um, there's so many people now that want to put everybody into a box. You know, you're a RNC guy, you're a Bush guy, you're an establishment guy, you're a Trump guy. And it's it, it I, the thing I I think is that it's just not as simple as people want it to be. Um, no, not at all. I think the problem that that people don't necessarily and it's not a I, I'm not I'm not disparaging anybody, but like when the game is in town, right? So if there's whoever the nominee is, I, I've been a lifelong Republican. That's that's who I'm with, right? Um, so it's not there are people that I've liked more than others, but I, I think the people who aren't in the game don't necessarily appreciate that 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 that. It's it's not that you have to be one team or the other. Um, let me let me kind of move on because I know after Bush leaves office, Matt, you 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 get this job in in the corporate world working for Coke Industries. Um, you guys start a family, um, and then I I'm sort of fascinated by by this part of it. So walk me through. I mean, right now again, I don't want to get too far out in the story, but but. Everybody now, I mean, not everybody, I think a lot of people know Matt and Mercy from CPAC. CPAC is run by the American Conservative Union. You are now chairman of that. So how did you get involved in the ACU? And, and how did that, what, what, what was, 
what where did you go from leaving the administration or from Coke or wherever and then getting involved in ACU? You know, so I'd always been a conservative. I was a I was a strange political operative because uh, most political operatives are don't tend they tend to be ideologically uh, flexible to to be kind. They just they're either Republican or Democrat, but they just want to win races. The you know animating the issues and getting them executed is not what 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 kind of motivates them. And so in the political office in Austin, I think I had a reputation for somebody who actually was uh, conservative. And uh, I did get this job at Coke Industries, which was a, a hometown company for me. I did not enjoy my time there in all candor, was not personally fulfilling for me. And uh, But during that time, I was asked to be on the board of CPAC, uh, which is kind of what, how we refer to it now, but you're right, American Conservative Union. And I was just a regular old board member of which there was something like 40. Right. And over the years, we moved from David Keene being the chairman to Al Cardenas being the chairman. And when Al was chairman, he's now married to Anna Navarro, which tells yes. you how interesting all the Bush world stuff is. But um, uh, while uh, Al was chairman, the organization fell on some financial hard times, and that resulted in an opening uh, for the chairman's race. And I decided to throw my hat into it. And and that and so, you, and you just sort of said, "Hey, I want to I I want to lead this. Like I want I want to make it better." What was the motivation? Well, it was in a lot of economic turmoil because they had to you know they were in debt. They had a lot of bills that needed to be paid after a big CPAC conference. Most people run from that. <laughs> everyone did on the board. Nobody wanted the job. Nobody saw it as anything other than a very difficult thing to raise money for. You know, CPAC is a very difficult thing to run because it's kind of like when I did personnel at the White House. You think, oh, I'm going to make all these great friends. No, all you do is make a lot of people mad at you because they're like, why didn't I get a speech? Why didn't I speak longer? Why didn't we get right. a better booth? So it's kind of all downside, not upside. But a couple of people who are close to me said, look, this is perfect, right in your sweet spot. You'll be able to turn the organization around and you'll be able to turn it into something better. And then we had just hired Dan Schneider, who unfortunately has just left us, but uh, Dan Schneider to run the organization. And he had discovered some of the problems, uh, uh, the financial insecurity of it. And so we kind of all just said, hey, this could work great. Uh, you, it was unpaid and part-time. So you know there was only so much you could do in that capacity, but with Dan's able talents and a good team around him, uh, we've had a really good run. But it, it, the funny thing is, I, you and I have talked about this uh, on my show, uh, and we talked about it at two CPACs ago, I guess, the, the Florida one. But, I mean, 20 years ago, it was in a downtown D.C. hotel. You'd go in and you'd have a bunch of guys, uh, grassroots folks, giving out flyers. And, you know, yes. and, and it was sort of like it was – um, I don't even know the right, like there, there's, gonna, I mean, I felt like it's a mix between a Qantas club and a young right. Republicans meeting, <laughs> right. but it was, and, and, you know, you would, you would go it there. It was quirky. Meeting. It was quirky, but I mean, it was sort of like, it was where everybody went um, in the political world, but, but not in the way that it is now. It's, it, I mean, there is much more of a, of a, you know, a rock star, political rock star equality now where the, the, the production value is very high. Um, the interest, the number of people who cover it, like what, what was that transition? Like, what... I would, I'd say this, Sean, you know, um, the, your questions are good and they deserve some thoughtful answers. I'll simply say this, what I have, I'm 54 now. What I have noticed is I'm not the most successful person that I know. I haven't made every right business decision, but I do think that in any of these enterprises, you got to be able to quickly make decisions with the information you have at hand. And I think what we did under a lot of duress because we couldn't really hire out the talent that we needed when you were in that much financial turmoil. But you know, I'll give Al Cardenas, my previous chairman, a lot of credit. He was the one who said, no, it has to look good. He had a little Donald Trump to him in that sense. He was like, so we got to go to the best hotel, even if we can't afford it. Now to me, because I worry <laughs> about money, I would never do something I couldn't afford. But Al, being from Miami and being a little flashy, said, hey, we're going to the best hotel, whether and the money will come. And so, but he had the right idea. You, you really, we really needed to be uh, at a better hotel, and, and he made that decision. Yeah, and, but then he tried to bankrupt ACU, and then he married Anna Navarro. I, those I, are look, two I didn't say he, I didn't say that he should run your organization if you're out there listening. <laughs> right. I simply said that was that was a good decision. What we and did, to make the assumption that the Miami people are all flashy schlap, that's a that's oh, been a little too shocking. Hard. shocking. Just, I know. They are, they are a little hey, more flashy just, than the Wichita people. Okay, just a little bit. Just because we dress really well. See, there and, you go. You know. 
Mercy, I got to ask this before. I, I, there's You're two correct. questions Mercy I want to get. I want to get to, but I, I, you, 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 you brought it up. You, you always refer to Matt as Schlapp. Has that been something from day one? <laughs> Well, We're we not going to tell you what she really calls me, Sean. It's not really. No, I think uh, look, it's always out of it's co out of complete and absolute love, quite frankly. But it's usually when he's in trouble. Then it then the shot. Ah. So, so basically, she's lying. But okay. the, uh, <laughs> so anyway, on this decision making thing, I think what we ended up doing, what I have learned over my eight years or whatever doing this job, is when you're in these political jobs where you have very little time and you have you don't have perfect information. And you don't always have the right people around you to get the information. There is a skill towards creating a system whereby you mostly make good decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think whether it was God's grace or whatever, we started to make better decisions and we started to see clearly. And the one reason we, I think we made good decisions is we didn't deceive ourselves mm. with how bad it was. Like we didn't try to say that we had all these things fixed that weren't fixed. We were really mired in the fact that look we are where we are and i think if people will do that you can get out of almost anything maybe it's hard to get out of prison but almost anything else you can get out of if you just start tomorrow making good decisions and we had people around us that helped us do that so mercy you, you know matt obviously jumped into this part-time unpaid thing but you've really embraced it as well i mean you're you are, are there a lot you're uh, do you do this podcasting what have what is that something that you just decided hey i love this too i'm going to do this with matt is that something that matt asked you to do i mean what what oh i asked her to do yeah it. he That's did ask me certain. to do it so i think look it was right after the election and i to be honest i was pretty i mean as most of us we were pretty depressed i mean i think i went two weeks that, that I barely spoke that even my children like mom, it's going to be okay. Cause it was just so rough, right? Like 2020 was just rough. We had been on the campaign trail. Matt and I were tag teaming, basically going crisscrossing, you know, through the nation, uh, campaigning for president Trump. And so when, you know, everything kind of ended the way it ended, I really had to figure out, well, what was my next step? Well, you know, a couple of things. One is, is if you can recall, the left made it very clear that you needed to be in a no hire list if you worked for the Trump administration. Now, you know, the good thing for me was that I'm, I could very happily stay home with my girls and, and, and make sure that I keep raising my children, which is a priority for our family, because uh, I was a stay at home mom for quite some time. And and you know, worked at the White House, which was a huge sacrifice for our family, and then worked on the campaign, another big sacrifice. So I was kind of ready to just, I don't wanna say take it easy, cause that's not the right word, but just kind of refocus a little bit um, and take time to figure out what were the, the next steps I was gonna do. And Matt, you know, I spent so much time building the Trump uh, online channel and it was a very successful endeavor. And so Matt's like, well, let's bring it over to CPAC. Why don't you start building online programming? Let's make it so that we have CPAC 365, where we're really communicating with our grassroots activists on what's happening here in the swamp. I mean, it's similar to what you do, Sean, at Newsmax. And whenever I have a chance to guest host there, being able to just talk, analyze the news, analyze what's going on and, and give that information to those uh, really seeking the truth. And so I was so happy to, to, to come over and help Matt and rebuild the communications team here and really start building the programming around it. We've had huge success on our online channel, um, you know, where we would, you know, we can easily get between 500,000 to a million views and, and continue to push out incredible social media content. And I, and so I feel that we are really active right now on the social media the, space. The, uh, the thing is you ask about CPAC and when people think about ACU's history, they think about CPAC, right? That makes sense. It's right. a big splashy event that everyone really does go to. And what's amazing, Sean, is the B-roll that comes out of CPAC and all the photos, you know, when you see someone of note on the Republican side, you will see them. If you look closely, uh, standing in front of a CPAC um, a stage, sign on a CPAC stage. But what I'm the most proud of is that we took an organization that was known for having a big conference and we are now a, a fierce right. advocacy group that has a big grassroots army that hits hard that has a staff that is in the fight. And that was always the piece we were missing. We talked a good game about being grassroots, but that was true once a year at our conference where we grassroots the other 364 days or I guess 361 days. And I would say we weren't. And I think today we-, we How big are, is that board now, Matt? You, you said it was 40. It's smaller. I've tried over time to, um, I've successfully 
reduce the size. The reason why you have a big board is so that you know this at the RNC, it creates enough uh, organizational chaos that no one can really be, uh, <laughs> no one can really kind of like uh, be a, a rival. And, uh, and so that's good if the chairman wants a lifetime tenure, but I actually would be very happy to have like the next challenge come over the next few years and see what God has in store for us or, or I'll stay if that's, if that's what I'm supposed to do, but it shouldn't be because the board's dysfunctional. So we've taken that board, we've reduced it, not by half, but close and uh, have a real functioning executive committee. I'm very proud of the board. Now, one of the things we had to do with the board, Sean, in the age of cancel cultures, I had to make it anonymous because um, ah. they, everyone started getting attacked. As we started getting better, not just at the conference, but with our advocacy, our board members started getting attacked. And so uh, there, we, there are board members who are, are public people and, and will say they're on our board, but I don't talk about the other board members because it's simply not safe to be on the board of a conservative group in America today. Is that your choice or theirs? Uh, it was a combination. One board member said, hey, look, uh, he's a member of a law firm and he was getting uh, pressure from people to quit. And I just said, look, this is a good, uh, this is the canary in the coal mine. I, I need to make everyone anonymous. And that's what yeah. I did. Mercy, you, you brought up uh, your kids. I, I've talked about this with my, about my situation. I've talked about it with Sarah Sanders and hers. You and Matt have five, five daughters. Um, Matt, you mentioned cancel culture. Um, you, you guys have, because of some of your public uh, pronouncements on issues, um, you've, you've lost a lot financially of clients that you, you have with your other firm. Um, but I, I'm always fascinated about, about the, the, the aspect of children, right? I was very, very private. Um, I realized that. Um, how have you guys addressed the profile of your kids in this age as they get older? Do you want, do you allow them to be on social media? Do you, I mean, they've, they've got to deal, I guess, in some ways with the public pronouncements that their parents make, their appearances, their issues, Matt, you mentioned, I mean, just being on the conference, you know, going, so how do you guys Let balance? Let me just say, first of all, uh, Sean, you helped us when we uh, published this book uh, uh, probably a year ago now. And um, in, in the book, I write a letter basically to my kids, you know, not apologizing for who I am, but basically saying, I know that it comes with some consequences that most kids don't have to deal with. Um, the fact that your government teacher hates you maybe, or <laughs> your history teacher, or, you know. Maybe... Or as my daughter told me the other day, my college professor knows exactly who my parents are. That yeah. one's always a good one, John. Just that wait for that one. That's not always so good. <laughs> but, or they don't get a part in a play or whatever, and you just, doesn't make sense to you. So, you know, they, they have to deal with that. I would say, otherwise, we try not to talk about it in a public setting because, I feel like it just makes matters worse. I think that my kids, I wouldn't blame them if they hated politics so much and hated my politics so much that it almost almost pushed them to the other side. So I think we're really careful to not um, to not make everything about politics. The problem is the way the left is oriented is they want to make everything political, the mask, science, you know, whether or not you have school or not. They've just, there's such this toxic nature to everything. I would say, that my kids that were more likely to go along with the Fauci fascism kind of idea, I think over time, I think they've seen that these people don't care about them. These okay. people just want to control and them. They canceled every dance. They canceled every ball game. Yeah. They canceled school itself. They canceled church. And I, and they canceled every trip. I, they couldn't go to, our one daughter couldn't go to Italy with her yeah. class like she had been looking to, looking forward to for three years. So I actually think that we, us being more quiet about politics and them just observing has probably made them be more Well, I don't think we're very quiet about politics. I think they, you know, we talk about politics all the time as we talk about the importance of our faith, which I think is what centers and is the foundation of our family. I think it's important for them, you know, they work, especially pretty much all the girls, especially our three older ones right now who are, you know, teenagers, they work these CPAC events. They're working 12 to 14 hour days. Um, they're given big responsibilities and they learn. Like it's a lot of it is through osmosis. A lot of it is being able uh, to meet so many of our wonderful colleagues like yourself, where they're exposed to these very, um, you know, to these ideas. And of course, obviously we want them to formulate their own ideas, but it's also very important as parents to present the truth and, and explain to them, for example, when they go to a certain news outlet, like it's going to be biased because of X, Y, Z. And so I think 
for us, you know, as I've explained to the kids, I go, as much as you think that you don't, you don't want it. Like I've heard it from one of our girls who's like a big dancer. And she's like, I just don't want to be involved in politics. I go, I know you don't want to be involved in politics, but politics will always be part of your life because every decision that is made from the local level to the federal level, it impacts your life one way or another. And if you have bad leadership in America, like in, you've seen in these other countries, it creates, it, 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 it could be bad, like it could destroy a nation. And that's why it's so important to stay involved uh, at, in some way in politics, whether you, you know, quote unquote, make it a career, make a career of it or not make a career of it, but at least know that you need to be part of this process. Let me end with this, um, or, or at least the, the, what's next for you guys? Like Matt, you mentioned, do you want to stay on? I was going to go to lunch. Go to what lunch. are you going to do? Oh my gosh, yeah. I almost got my same answer. I haven't. I ate lunch. early. Oh, there you go. There I, you, go. I, you know, I think the problem in the world today is it's so chaotic and evil. Let's just say what it is. It's evil out there, and I, I think we're very much more open now to a, a wide variety of things including running to the hills uh, with our ammo <laughs> and our powdered food. But the, uh, we, uh, I think we're open to whatever God wants us to do. I think we are very, um, what, you know, I've tossed out the manual that would have had what my career path should have been. And, uh, you know, some things happened to us that weren't fair and uh, weren't just, but that's the time we're in. So you accept them. And, uh, and I'm, I have to say, I'm a joyful person. I'm excited about tomorrow. Um, we have a really blessed life. I always say my life never goes right, but it goes well, which is exactly right. It never goes according to plan, but then it just kind of takes a turn and then it goes really well. So I'll add that, you know, the quote I'll end with, uh, Sean, is from a saint, Saint Gianna Mola. And it's basically, my daughter sent it, our oldest sent, sent it to me. And it says, the secret to happiness is to live moment by moment and to thank God for what he is sending us every day in his goodness. And I think that's our goal. It's moment to moment. It's knowing that what we do hopefully will be, uh, you know, for the, the betterment of this country, for the betterment of the next generation and, and really in, enjoying what, I th what we believe we're called to do. And it comes with sacrifice. And yes, it comes with pain sometimes and it comes uh, with challenges, but uh, I think it's made us just stronger people and stronger parents and stronger leaders. And I think that, you know, as, as President Trump will say, the best is yet to come. And we got to keep, I think, in this, this journey that we are in, this fight that we've been basically um, asked to do. Yes or no, real quick. Will either one of you be on a ballot? Oh. <laughs> I think Mercy will run for office. Uh, you know, if we've the door opens, it. we've thought about it. We've talked about it. Matt's been approached multiple times. I think, you know, if it's the, the fact right is, opportunity, is I've we given would it think about it. Some serious thought. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for one reason or another, it just wasn't to be. Um, you know how this works, Sean. Oh, yeah. Um, it has to kind of, everything kind of has to line up. Uh, otherwise, it's a very frustrating process for people. But, Sean, if you run for mayor of, of Alexandria, I, I want to be your campaign manager. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll go down. Bring again. it on. Let's we'll do it. You know, people <laughs> don't know, but Sean and Mercy and I, we all go to the same church and Every time the church is, you know, every church has their little issues. And I always tell the pastor, I'm like, just, you really want to blow everyone's head in DC media. Just put down press contact, Sean Spicer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, all right. We end the podcast with a quick lightning round. Uh, oh. just one word answer. When ready? he does this, this is hard. Okay, Sean, be ready. You can't right. do one word answer. No, this is going to be hard. When you're you traveling. Know you we're going to so, have Matt, Matt, you go first, then Mercy. When you're traveling, do you arrive early or just in time? Just in time. Late. How long? We how low will you let your cell phone battery go? Uh, to the end. It, oh no. it oftentimes has no juice. Like ten percent. Oh my god! How many unread emails do each of you have? Millions. <laughs> Nineteen thousand. Okay, good, good. How clean is your house? Spotless. You look good. If you Stop 40, answer. <laughs> okay. If you had 48 hours to binge a show, what would it be? Oh. Stranger Things. I, I, I prefer to read. I'm not a big show person. What would you read? Huh? Anything. I mean, I'm reading so many different one books. Anything historic. I know I don't have a one word answer. Say Matt's book. Matt's book. There, there you, you go. go. And followed by Sean's book, Radical Nation. All right. Least favorite chore. R least favorite chore. Yep. Um, Oh, oh, this should be easy. Taking out the garbage. Picking up dog poop. Oh, wow. Someone likes folding laundry then. 
Uh, <laughs> if you could have a drink with anyone, who would it be? Alive or dead? Either one. Um, dead? I, well, I, uh, I mean, Jesus Christ likes wine, so I'd have to go with Jesus. Jesus is still alive. I know. He is. Matthew, I know. Go ahead. Uh, Abraham Lincoln. Coolest celebrity you've ever met. Oh, Matt. Okay, I thought you were going to. <laughs> um, coolest celebrity I ever met. Of course, Lou Holtz. Biggest pet peeve. Oh, Matt's Twitter feed sometimes. <laughs> Biggest pet peeve. Oh, Matt, you have so many. You have I have like a so whole 125 many. It's impossible. House. How about the one, just the latest one? I know this one. While my staff is looking at me here. Typos and tweets. How about that? That's there a good go. one. What's something that each of you won't go cheap on? Oh, my gosh. I'd say, oh, I don't know. Wine. Oh, you'd go cheap on wine. Are you kidding me? No, I me? don't like to. No, but you do. Um, I would <laughs> say I don't jewelry. Like it. Okay. But you buy, you, I don't buy myself jewelry, so. All right. This is the last one here. If uh, Since I did my reality TV stint, what show <laughs> would you go on if you had to go on a reality TV show? would not wear that pirate shirt for all the money in the world. Sean. Which one? She wore a lime it green. It was not pirate. It was like what a was salsa it? Fluffy? thing. It was a fluffy yeah. shirt. Okay, so now I can't even remember the question. Okay. The what reality TV show would you go on? Go would on. I go on? Yeah. I would do Dancing with the I Stars. I would do Dancing with the Stars, too. Oh, I'd totally do it. a couple out of this. Or that but singing I could, one. I, I would dance. do that singing one. I know, Mercy. I, oh, oh. Uh, whose voice is it? Yeah, the voice one. Oh, you could totally do that. I could do that. But I wouldn't do like. I would have paid you for a cooking show. I'm not going to oh, do like Survivor Island great. or whatever that yeah, is. Yeah, the that cooking show is good. I would love to do the cooking show. All with, right. Um, These are the last five. It goes quick. Ready? Data or data? Data. Data. Yeah. Gala or gala? Gala. Gala. Iran or Iran? I Iran. Iran. Carmel or caramel? Carmel. Caramel. Caramel. <laughs> aunt or aunt? Aunt. Tia. <laughs> oh look at that the Kansan going spanish yes matt and mercy you guys have been more than generous thank you it's been this a fun so conversation fun. All, right, all right come Sean. on over come hang out with us we'll see you matt, matt just as a reminder what's the name of the book the desecrators it's a real upper there you go all right put your cowboy boots on get a copy of matt's book and uh go to cpac and check it all out anyway thank you guys i appreciate it. thanks sean guys. take care Well, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I think it's fascinating. Um, so much of how their life evolved over the last couple of decades, where they are now, where they might be headed. Um, also, what this, where, how CPAC has changed. And, you know, for me, I started going to CPAC in the 90s. Um, and so to watch it change the way it has has been fascinating. Um, so it's, it's, it, was a, it was fun for me to be able to talk to them in a way that, you know, these aren't the normal conversations you have when you go hang out at someone's house. So it's fun to talk about their beginnings and where they are now and, and how their family has changed. It's just fascinating because CPAC has changed and grown into a much more dynamic organization than it was, say, even 10 years ago. Anyway, um, I have a special thought for, so um, as you head into Labor Day, uh, if you're looking for something, you want to catch up on some of the episodes, great. There's a lot of great conversations to have. If you are willing to take the time to go um, write a review and screenshot it and DM us, um, I'm going through, I'm going to choose a bunch of people. I've got a ton of like RNC and white house swag that I need to downsize. Um, and I'm looking to give it away to some loyal listeners. So if you want to write a review for us, um, and rate us, DM us, I will pick some random people and send them some swag. Um, so anyway, uh, please do that. Please take the time to just hit that little five star button, review it. Make sure you're subscribing because then you automatically get these episodes. Thanks a lot for doing this. Enjoy Labor Day. Catch up on the episodes, and I'll see you on Monday. It is Labor Day, but we're going to put something out, so enjoy. Enjoy.